you know, the judicial ethics has also been a great concern for many democratic nations in the recent past. And we are so glad to have four judges with us and all four of them would be sharing a different perspectives of their respective countries. Judge Andrea is from Brazil, Judge Keith Barnes is from US, and we are going to be joined by Justice Anil Kumar Sinha from uh, Nepal, and of course, our own beloved Justice Abhilasha Kumari from India. So we all are so eager to listen to their views, uh, and I'm really looking for a very interesting discussions, the question and sessions and interactions at the end of uh, the sessions. So not taking much of your time, I. Uh, on behalf of the Institute of Law Nearby University and Student Fraternity, uh, wholeheartedly welcome all our four distinguished speakers. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, ma'am. For all the participants, let me introduce the panel. Uh, we have with us Honorable Justice Abhilasha Kumari. Honorable Justice Anil Kumar Sinha will be joining us. Judge Keith Barnes from Utah, uh, USA and Judge Andreas Gelhardo from Brazil. Justice Abhilasha Kumari is currently working as the judicial member of Lokpal in India. She has also been first lady chief justice of the Manipur High Court and has also served as the judge in Gujarat High Court. She has also been a chairperson of the Human Rights Commission in the state of Gujarat. Now let me introduce uh, Honorable Justice Anil Kumar Sinha. Uh, Mr. Sinha is currently serving as a judge of Supreme Court of Nepal. He has also served as a senior uh, advocate in the Supreme Court of Nepal prior to his appointment as a judge. Justice Sinha was a national consultant for the public-private partnership for urban environment. Justice Sinha has also assisted in identifying requisited changes in Customs Act in compliance with international conventions. Uh, now let me introduce Judge Keith Barnes. Judge Keith Barnes is an associate uh, presiding judge for the 5th Judicial District in Utah, USA. Judge Barnes has been practicing law as owner and lead attorney for Barnes Law Office in Cedar City, uh, Utah uh, State of USA. Judge Barnes is recognized as a top attorney for civil litigation, criminal defense, and adoption law. Prior to practicing at his own law firm, Judge Barnes was partner at Jensen, Graf, and Barnes, and Park and Barnes, both in Cedar City. His career began as an associate attorney at the Park firm, where his primary responsibilities were handling the Iron County Defender contract and family law cases. Uh, now, let me introduce. Judge Andreas Gelardo. Judge Andreas Gelardo Palma is a civil law judge working currently at the Sao Paulo uh, State Court, uh, Brazil, with great experience in litigation over the contract in general, torts, cooperation, construction law, public contracts. She's in charge of uh, second regional corporate insolvency and arbitration court in Sao Paulo City, Brazil which cover 29 industrial cities around Sao Paulo state. She, she took part in many lawsuits involving contracts, insolvency, recovery, and domestic arbitration, issuing provisions, provisioning measures and awards under Brazilian arbitration law. Now, uh, before beginning this, uh, this panel discussion, let me brief you the order of discussion. So first, uh, Justice Abhilasha Kumari will be sharing the Indian perspective for 10 to 15 minutes. Then Judge Keith Barnes will share the broader perspective of judicial ethics in USA for 20 minutes. Then Justice Anil Kumar Sena, who will be joining us, will share the pers Nepal, Me Nepal's perspective for 15 minutes. Then Judge Andrea Gelardo will be discussing on the theme of the day from Brazilian perspective. OK, at last. Uh, we will have the question and answer session. So uh, again, before just commencing this panel discussion, I will request all the participants to switch on their videos, keep their microphones on mute mode. Uh, participants can direct their questions directly to me in private chat, which will be taken up at the end of the session. Uh, now, without much ado, I will request uh, Justice Abhilasha Kumari, ma'am, to uh, deliver his speech. Man. Thank you. 
Professor Purvi, Dr. Purvi Pokharia, Director and Dean Institute of Law, Nirma University, Judge Keith Barnes, Fifth District Court Judge Uta USA, Justice Andrea Galhado Palma, Civil Judge Sao Paulo Court, Brazil, professors, academicians, lawyers, students, ladies, and gentlemen. I'm indeed honored and privileged to get this opportunity to put forward my views to such a distinguished gathering. I'm grateful to Professor Dr. Pokharyal for kindly extending this in in invitation to me to interact with you and discuss the varied perspectives of the topic for our panel discussion, which is judicial ethics. In my view, judicial ethics is a very important topic and can be said to be the bedrock of the judicial system, not only in India, but in any country of the world. In every society in the world, whether primitive or evolved, democratic, or subscribing to any other form of government, a need has always been felt for an independent and impartial judicial system that imparts justice to the aggrieved person and resolves disputes according to the laws of the land without fear or favor or affection or bias. In order to maintain the integrity and independence of the judicial system prevailing in any part of the world, it is imperative that judges who are the faces of the judicial system remain above reproach in as much as their person, personal and professional conduct is impeccable. To meet these lofty standards, judges the world over must follow certain values or a code of conduct that must be imbibed and practiced throughout their lives. It must come to them as naturally and effortlessly as breathing. A judge must be humble and unaffected by the powers of office and must meticulously uphold the cherished values of judicial life. Only by doing so will the judiciary gain and maintain the faith and trust of the people, even in scenarios where their trust in other institutions of governance has been eroded. The faith that the common man reposes in the judiciary is its most valuable and priceless asset. Faith breeds respect and respect cannot be commanded. It has to be earned every inch of the way. Judges are under scrutiny at all times and must live and perform their duties in a manner that sets them apart from others while living in society and instill confidence in the people who expect and deserve the highest standards of integrity from the judiciary. It is precisely for this reason that judi judicial ethics are so important. There cannot be any airtight definition of judicial ethics that can broadly be said to be those values and standards of conduct and action that members of the judicial fraternity are expected to adhere to and uphold. They may include moral precepts, but are much wider than that. There is a subtle distinction between morals and ethics. Moral values define a person's ideas about good and bad, right or wrong, and are motivated by an intention to be a good person. Moral values are largely shaped by family, environment, culture, and belief systems. A code of ethics is much broader and transcends a person's background 
embracing a much larger class of persons, maybe from different backgrounds, belief systems, or societies who are committed to a common cause, such as the independent and impartial dispensation of justice and adhere to a value system or code of conduct that regulates their conduct and defines them as a fraternity. Judicial ethics can therefore be said to be a self-imposed code of conduct that is universal and accepted beyond geographical boundaries, belief systems, or forms of govern governance prevailing in any place. Referring to the Indian perspective in judicial ethics, I would now come to, first of all, the constitutional oath that is taken by judges of the Supreme Court and High Courts in India on their elevation to those positions, which is indicative of the high standards expected from them in the performance of their duties and what should be kept in mind and put into practice at all times. A judge swears and affirms that he or she will bear true faith and allegiance to the Constitution of India as by law established, uphold the sovereignty and integrity of India duly and faithfully and to the best of ability, knowledge and judgment, perform the duties of office without fear or favor, affection or ill will, and uphold the constitution and the laws. Adherence to the rule of law, independence and impartiality in the performance of duties as a judge are ingrained in this oath, which is remembered by all judges, I think, every day. Judicial ethics are not confined to only the professional conduct of a judge, but have much wider implications, casting a solemn obligation on a judge to mold his or her persona and life accordingly. On the 7th of May, 1997, the Supreme Court of India adopted the restatement of values of judicial life, which reiterates universally accepted norms and guidelines and conventions observed by judges. These were adopted by the Indian judiciary in the Chief Justice's conference in 1999. All the high courts of India have also adopted the same. There are six, uh, six points in this restatement of values and I'll read all of them because you, these will illustrate how these values, they govern the entire personal and professional life and conduct of a judge in India. Justice, the first concept is, justice must, must not merely be done, but it must also be seen to be done. The behavior and conduct of members of the higher judiciary must reaffirm the people's faith in the impartiality of the judiciary. Accordingly, any act of a judge of the Supreme Court or a high court, whether in official or personal capacity, which erodes the credibility of this perception has to be avoided. Number two, a judge should not contest the election to any office of a club, society, or other association. Further, he should not hold such elective office except in a society or association connected with the law. Number three, close association with individual members of the bar, particularly those who practice in the same court shall be eschewed. Four, a judge should not permit any member of his immediate family, such as spouse, son, daughter, son-in-law or daughter-in-law or any other close relative, if a member of the bar, to appear before him or even be associated in any manner with the cause to be dealt with by him. Five, no member of his family who is a member of the bar shall be permitted to use the residence 
in which the judge actually resides or other facilities for professional work. Six, a judge should practice a degree of aloofness consistent with the dignity of his office. Seven, a judge shall not hear and decide a matter in which a member of his family, a close relation or a friend is concerned. Eight, a judge shall not enter into public debate or express his views in public on political matters or on matters that are pending or are likely to arise for judicial determination. Nine, a judge is expected to let his judgment speak for themselves. He shall not give interviews to the media. Ten, a judge shall not accept gifts or hospitality except from his family, close relations and friends. 11, a judge shall not hear and decide a matter in which a company in which he holds shares is concerned unless he has disclosed his interest and no objection to his hearing and deciding the matter is raised. Mm. 12, a judge shall not speculate in shares, stocks or the like. 13, a judge shall not engage directly or indirectly in trade or business either by himself or in association with any other person, publication of a legal treatise or any activity in the nature of a hobby shall not be construed as trade or business. 14, a judge should not ask for, accept contributions or otherwise actively associate himself with the raising of any fund for any purpose. 15, a judge should not seek any financial benefit in the form of a perquisite or privilege attached to his office unless it is clearly available. Any doubt in this behalf must be got resolved and clarified through the Chief Justice. 16. Every judge must at all times be conscious that he is under the public gaze and there should be no act of omission by him which is unbecoming of the high office he occupies and the public esteem in which the office is held. These values of judicial life are illustrative, but they are not exhaustive. A judge may have to face many difficult and unprecedented situations in the courtroom or in society where these values will guide the conduct of the judge and bestow courage while dealing with them in a just and befitting manner. A judge must have deep knowledge of the laws of the land and learn to apply them in a manner that delivers justice in accordance with the prevailing law, where interpretation of law calls for the use of discretion. It must be done judiciously and compass compassionately with regard to precedence and never arbitrarily. The insights imbibed from the core values of judicial ethics combined with the knowledge of law help in finding innovative and adequate solutions to problems within the bounds of law while redressing the grievances of litigants in a fair and just manner. Judicial integrity is at the heart of judicial ethics. Every judge is a human being coming from a certain linguistic societal, geographical, or religious background. A judge may ascribe to a personal philosophy and have certain propensities as a result of such background, impartial, impartiality is an independence in delivering justice as per law are essential qualities in a judge. And all personal philosophies and propensities must stay in the background when this great duty is called upon. When a judge sits in the chair of justice, all personal beliefs and philosophies must remain in suspended animation and he or she must approach the matter at hand with an open mind, with the sole aim of doing complete justice without fear or favor, affection or ill will. The trust and faith bestowed by the people upon the judiciary casts a corresponding responsibility upon the judicial fraternity. 
to follow the canons of judicial ethics and maintain the dignity of office, it is almost like a sacred trust or obligation that must be fulfilled with honor and dignity, uplifting the perception of the judiciary in the eyes of the common man. Ultimately, when all is said and done, the most important requirement is that a good judge must also be a good human being, which is the ultimate aspiration of humanity. I thank you once again for inviting me to be a part of this August gathering. Discussions such as the pre present one will leave, lead to a dissemination of ideas and practice and will, in the long run, strengthen the judiciary and the administration of justice. Thank you once again. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, you rightly said that there cannot be an airtight definition of judicial ethics. It is much more than simply the professional conduct of judges. Now I will request our second panel speaker, uh, Judge Keith Barnes, to share the U.S. perspective with the participants. Judge thank you Barnes. very much, uh, Professor Sharman. And, and thank you, uh, Justice Kumari, for your statement and remarks and thank you for your service to uh, not only the legal community in India who benefited from your service but also to the great country of, of India. Uh, to Dr. Purvi, moderator Sharman, my distinguished panelists, professors, judges and students, it's a distinct honor for me to be able to visit with you and share a few of my thoughts with you today. I feel like this is a, a second coming, if you will, because in 2018, my family and I had the pleasure of visiting your university and uh, had a pleasure of, of visiting the judicial college there and visiting with students as well as uh, distinguished scholars and visiting with students at Nurma University. And my wife and I had an opportunity of visiting informally and, and with groups of students and how impressed we were and how that uh, experience will have a lot, has a long lasting, will have a long lasting effect uh, on my family. To that, I again say uh, thank you. And I hope that our travels will meet again. As I thought about what to talk about here today, judicial ethics, uh, Justice Kamari did a, a wonderful job of, of laying the foundation and discussing that. But I thought and continue, my thoughts continued to circle to removing judicial and simply focusing first on ethics. Each of us have our own respective uh, uh, outlook and, 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 and beliefs, and as well as our respective roles in our own societies, whether you're a student or a professor or a judge. And yet ethics is something that is so important. It's a common thread that each of us should work towards on making uh, something that we live our lives by. And ethics simply starts with you. It's so important that we view our actions each and every day and that we take accountability and that we work towards that. It's important to be true to yourself, to be honest to yourself, to be ethical. I thought of an experience uh, that I had in my courtroom several years ago. There was a matter that came before me. It was a criminal matter and the defendant was charged with the offense of driving under the influence of alcohol. The defense team filed a motion to suppress, a pretrial motion, asking the court to consider on throwing the case out for a technicality. The officer who was subpoenaed by the defense took the witness stand and proceeded to answer questions of the uh, defense attorney. A DUI investigation is one that is really a procedural uh, steps that officers take. You need that probable cause to pull the driver over and then it leads further and further into investigation to if it rises to a certain level 
an individual can be arrested. And once they're arrested, they're taken to the police station. And at that time on a, on a driving under the influence of alcohol case, it leads to having a test done to determine either A, how much alcohol is one system or certainly how much alcohol was in one system. One of the steps, the procedural steps that's necessary is, is that before administering a breath alcohol test, it's important that the officer make certain that the individual who's being tested does not have anything in that person's mouth. That makes it so that saves the integrity. It's called the Baker rule. The officer checks the, the mouth and then needs to wait a minimum of 15 minutes before uh, administering the test. And during that time, the officer needs to be in visual of the individual. On this occasion, the officer began answering questions. And then when the, when the defense attorney began asking questions about the Baker rule, the officer seemed to kind of hum and haw. And then the question was posed, did you wait the 15 minutes after checking the mouth of the individual? I looked over at the officer and the officer looked down to look through his notes and then looked up and there was a pause. And after the pause, the officer said, no, I did not wait the 15 minutes. At that time, the officer was excused and the defense had no more questions. And, and this would ultimately lead to a dismissal of the case. As the officer was leaving my courtroom, I asked the officer if he could stay around for a minute so that I could visit with him about what transpired. He obliged. I met with him back in chambers. And as we began visiting about what transpired, I started off by saying, well, that was a tough day in court. And he replied saying, yes, it was. And I said, but this was a great day in your career. And he said, that's interesting. Why would you say that? And I said, because it's true that the case that uh, you just testified on, that case is going to be dismissed. However, you, you showed and demonstrated high ethics. You will rise in your uh, job as a police officer and whatever you choose to do. So this was a great day. When you have a moment where you could have said this, but you stayed with your uh, ethics. Nelson Mandela said, quote, honor belongs to those who never forsake the truth, even when things seem dark and grim, end of quotes. Certainly the officer at that time on the witness stand felt that things were quite dark and grim. But he certainly gained honor with me. And my guess is, is that because he made that decision to tell the truth, that his career, he will not find himself compromised as he will, he will always be ethical to his responsibilities and duties. A mentor to both myself and my, and my family growing up was a coach, a legendary coach by the name of John Wooden. To put in perspective this coach, uh, I look at, uh, he was a coach of basketball. And just like with your country's amazing sport of cricket, basketball is a big deal back in the States. Having now visited to India a couple of times, I will say I think that cricket's even a bigger deal in India than basketball in the States, if that's possible. But anyways, uh, if you can think of maybe a, a great coach who coached a cricket team, that might let you know about this John Wooden. Now, John Wooden's recognized by most people for the following. In the span of 11 years, he won 10 championships. During some of that uh, time period, he won 88 games in a row. He had many legendary players who, who played. But to me, what makes John Wooden great 
is because he was a man of great ethics. He is the only individual in the United States who is in the Hall of Fame, which is a recognized uh, award that someone receives, and both being a basketball player as well as a coach. After his playing days, uh, he served his country in World War II, came home and, and became a teacher at, in high school, and then he later became a coach on the college level. In 1946, he coached at, uh, at Indiana Teachers College. And that team was ranked number one at the end of the year. The end of the year it was customary that teams from the, each of the respective conferences, that they would uh, go on to a tournament. He, certainly his team was, was, was given an invitation, but he declined. He declined because he had a black player that played for his team and that the rules were is that black players could not, could not play in the tournament. The following year, the same thing happened. Again, his team was ranked number one. His team was invited to play in the tournament. He again, respectfully declined. But because of the impact that certainly a number one team would have they did, they immediately changed the rules and they made it. And so all players, regardless of color, could play. Now to me, that shows great integrity, great ethics by a by legendary coach that could have put basketball before humans. Yeah. He said this, one of his quotes, quote, be more concerned with your character then your reputation, because your character is what you really are, while your reputation is merely what others think you are. Now, let me take a, a few minutes and talk a little bit about judicial ethics uh, in the United States. Similar to what uh, Justice uh, Kumari uh, talked about, we also have in the United States a code of conduct as well as different canons that we follow. What is the code of conduct for judging the United States? Simply put, it's having integrity and independence. When I look at 2020, when all of us can look at 2020 and the challenges that 2020 presented us with the pandemic and other things that, 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 that transpire, it is a year that uh, we will all remember. In the United States, it was also a very challenging year when it came down to the political climate as you saw, as the world saw on the stage. It was not a defining moment for the United States, one that we are uh, proud of. There was something though that I want to, that I think relates to judicial ethics. The president at that time had made a number of appointments in fact, he probably had made more appointments to the bench than, than other judges, pardon me, than other presidents had, had done. There was some light discussion, some things may be said, that if things didn't go well for the president at that time, that the judiciary would come in and maybe make things right or make things different. I can say that it was a proud moment to be part of the judiciary in the United States when I was able to observe these great men and women who were appointed by Democrat as well as Republican presidents, but as they did not compromise their ethics and they looked at the facts and they looked at the law and they lived up to their 
responsibilities. Mahatma Gandhi said, quote, in matters of conscience, the law of the majority has no place. When I look at my own career and I think of being true to myself or true to, to the conduct that I need to, I think of something that, uh, that at the time I had to consider before I decided to place my name for consideration for a judgeship. And that is the death penalty. When I was a defense attorney, I represented many different individuals. And I do have a client of mine who was on death row at the Utah State Prison. Now for me, when I decided that I wanted to consider being a judge, I had to realize that there is a chance, a possibility that I may have to sign a death warrant at some point in my career. Fortunately, that has not happened to this point, but it is something that I had to consider, could or would I be willing to do that? And without getting into maybe where I stand, that would be very difficult uh, for me to do that. Now I offer that because as judges, as uh, Justice Kamari so well articulated, there are difficult decisions that need to be made. And I so much appreciated her saying that it's so important to be compassionate, to try to be kind, because when people come into each of our respective courtrooms or any courtroom throughout the world, those people deserve to have a judge who is compassionate, who is going to listen and be respectful to the parties that appear. I appreciate this opportunity to talk a little bit about judicial ethics and ethics. And I thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Judge Keith Vance. Thank you so much. Thank and you, we sir. are so glad that now Justice Anil Kumar Sinha could join us. We welcome Justice Sinha. Thank you so much for joining. We all know that it's such a big, busy day for you, but still you could uh, spare some time. Thank you so much. Thank you, Purvi. It was a difficult time, but still I could manage. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, sir. We welcome you on behalf of Institute of Law, Nirma University. Uh, we just saw on BBC News that uh, judgment uh, came, uh, which engaged you for weeks, I suppose. Uh, so, we, yes. <laughs> so uh, now I request uh, uh, Honorable Justice Anil Sinaji to uh, deliver his speech to share the Nepal's perspective on this particular topic on the theme of judicial ethics, sir. Uh, thank you very much, Nilas. Uh, I'm sorry that uh, I was so engaged. I could not even go back to my diaries or any uh, book or uh, I could not do any preparation for what to speak. But uh, at this moment, I will speak from my own uh, experience of what happened when we started uh, looking at this uh, constitution, constitutional issue and uh, the issue was basically revolving around whether a uh, majority government uh, in the parliament can dissolve the parliament uh, only for the reason that they could not work because of non cooperation of from the uh, for, from their own colleagues. Now the issue that came to us, uh, I'm not going to the details of that case, but the scene behind was uh, we it's, it's a very small place and. Uh, uh, me uh, coming from in the bench from the bar uh, <clears throat> for 34 years, and I'm just for last four years only at the Supreme Court. Uh, we have got clients, we have got friends in politics, in business, everywhere and all over Nepal. And the issue was we were getting a lots and lots of calls saying that, hey, I'm your friend. Uh, can we talk about 
this case. And that's where the issue of ethics actually came in front of us. Uh, we talked to everybody and we did not avoid, we did not close our phones. Um, there were sounds of, uh, I would not say threat, but still it was some sort of threat also saying that if you do this, it may happen. I've got this information and that information, but we went through, uh, you know, the first issue that I will share here was our own confidence in ourselves, our commitment to uphold the constitution and the independency of the judiciary, as well as the integrity of the judges. So uh, there are certain things about, when we talk about judicial ethics, uh, a judge cannot under learn anything from uh, black and whites. It comes out from education, the educational backgrounds, the um, uh, professional backgrounds, uh, it, its own uh, convictions, commitments, and those things actually come up and we, certainly we have, uh, there was a, a code of conduct uh, drafted by the judges uh, from the full court of the Supreme Court. And later on when uh, judicial council was formed, the judicial council came out with uh, different types of code of conduct from the, for the judges. Now there was a conflict even for us. And we said the Supreme Court judges and the High Court judges and even the District Court judges. I mean, it's uh, you cannot actually bound them by the four corners of a code of conduct. It comes from inside. I mean, it has to uh, be understood. It has to be there has to be a commitment uh, to say that yes, I'm here to do justice. I'm here to give um, uh, access to justices. I'm here to give quick, uh, deliver quick just, uh, judgments. All those things comes up. But still, there has to be some parameters where we do not need to go into a very much detail. Somehow, you know, it is very interesting. A uh, few of your friends, uh, our students, you may possibly do not know that our judicial council comprises of the chief judge, justice of the Supreme Court, the senior most judge of the Supreme Court and then the law minister and one member from the bar and one nominee uh, of the prime minister. So you will certainly find that somebody coming from bar, till date, we have not seen anybody who's completely independent. He has got some political affiliation and they are politically uh, nominated. So there are three persons from the political side and, and two from the judiciary. So, and that's how our bar council is comprised of and they are responsible for appointment of judges. And there has been instances, uh, which is uh, a talk of our um, uh, community, uh, that people from the judiciary, from political parties or cadres from the political parties are appointed. Uh, even you will uh, find that prime minister's uh, advisors, the attorney general, whom the prime minister advise, they find that that is the easiest way to be elevated as the judge of the Supreme Court in recent days. Um, because once they get appointed, the government has got the majority in the Judicial Council, so they can appoint somebody who, whom they, they will just pick up. And that has got a lot of effect in the Supreme Court. Now, today we came out with a situation where one of our justices, who was also a member of the Constituent Assembly earlier, as a nominee of one of the political party, she delivered a judgment I'm together with us, and it was an unanimous, unanimous decision. She delivered against the party, which actually nominated her to the um, uh, constitutional, uh, <clears throat> uh, sorry, uh, constituent assembly earlier. So that's what, what the issue is. That's the uh, you know, borderline where you say that where, whenever you are appointed as a judge, you must leave your past and live in the, leave the past and live in the present so that you do not have, you are not influenced by the politics, you are not influenced by the political parties, their own um, movements, their own mandates and all. Uh, it doesn't happen with everybody. It's a very, very rare situation that we face today. Uh, we had continuous uh, 10 hours of discussions on our drafts, uh, different drafts, and ultimately we came out we said we will come out with this. And I was very happy 
that uh, the independence of judiciary, the integrity of the judges were actually upheld today, where even now it is time for our political leaders to understand that once a judge is appointed at a court, he or she does not remain a cadre of the political parties. And that's where the issue of ethics comes up. Uh, we have, and, we, and, and the issue that I was trying to make here was that code of conduct drafted for us, the judges of the Supreme Court or the High Court, were drafted by three political people and two of the judges. So there was a majority of, from the political side. And then we said, we make our own code of conducts. There are self-made code of conducts. There, there might be some written code of conducts. But the issue has to be that the, the judicial ethics must revolve around what to do and what not to do and how to behave when you are working as a judge. So these issues basically um, are very rarely we found we find uh, being uh, applied in the court because there has been instance that at a high court, um, sometimes I get ashamed when I share this information. Uh, there was an appointment of 80 judges in the high court at one time. 80, I don't exactly remember the name, but it was around that. And out of which 12 were hardcore cadres from the ruling political party then. And after the appointment and when they took the oath, they went to the political party's office and expressed their gratitude towards the, um, the, 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 the leader of the political party, which was a huge you know, shame for us. And we had to come out with very strong instructions to those judges. And we said, either you give up your political affiliation or um, you give up your position. Uh, but that has not happened again. So slowly, after a severe politicization of our judicial system also, slowly it is coming to the track and with the uh, judgment that we came out with, with today, despite lots and lots of uh, difficult phases, um, there, was an, you know, there was a unanimity and uh, uh, there is the, all the media are saying uh, that uh, the independence of judiciary has been uh, upheld, upheld uh, and uh, there is a huge hope in judiciary. So this is a faith. The judges must find a way to give a faith to the general public saying that despite all odds and events, difficult situations, circumstances, um, the judiciary is there, the courts are there to help and work for the, um, for the people, common people who are in need and who are in injustice. Uh, so that's uh, where the uh, code of conduct, even for the judges also comes up with. Now, other things are, you know, uh, we have certain written things uh, I have, uh, my code of conduct next to me here, it says that the, the independence has to be maintained, the integrity has to be maintained, and it has to be elaborated. And uh, then it says the code of conducts are, you know, you should not uh, be influenced from outside and all those things which are ornamental. For me, it is all ornamental wordings. Uh, what you have to do is has to come up from you within. Uh, then it also talks about Sadatsa. So my code of conduct even asks us how to be dressed up. Okay. And certainly it is an issue inside the court, but I don't know whether uh, going around in, on my vacations, so should I be uh, ruled by my code of conduct or not? I don't know. Uh, but anyway, uh, this, there, there are lots of, it's a huge, very long list, uh, but Basically, as I would say that, you know, uh, uh, one challenge that we have is the sufficiency in the court and the court staffs, trained court staffs, because uh, we, the court does not get sufficient from, fund from the government. Out of the budget, we only have got 0.34% of the national budget. Uh, we have been asking for 1%. And you will be surprised that we do not, we have not been able to buy a single computer for last one year. Uh, for entire judiciary in the whole country. And then we want our staffs in the court to be very efficient and active so that they can actually write the judgments within time. Uh, we had a lots of backlogs, even at my Supreme Court, a um, few of the cases are almost one and a half years old, which has not been totally written. Uh, the written verdict has not uh, come out. 
because there might be a situation where the parties do not are not interested to get a copy of that, but uh, or they uh, are, uh, you know, I don't know for certain reasons. And we have been trying to upgrade the quality of our judicial officers. And um, there are few people who are interested to come to the judiciary because they do not get sufficient facilities here. They do not get um, much chances for their um, uh, hierarchy because in appointment in the high courts, um, where even the lawyers are also allowed with uh, an experience of 15 years minimum, uh, people are coming in under the political, as I said, uh, political recommendations also. Uh, and uh, there are many people in the judiciary of, of, among our own staff members who are very frustrated and do not see a good opportunity to get an up uh, to go to the high court and all all those things are happening but still one of our uh, requirement at this moment and part of our uh, code of conduct is to deliver just speed the delivery of justice and to write judgments on time and deliver it so that it is effectively uh, implemented and as a very uh, strong uh, or a very new concept, we introduced in our courts the uh, we call it differentiated case management system (DCM), whereby we have categorized cases uh, based on simple cases uh, and ordinary, simple, and complex. So six months, one year, and eighteen months maximum at the lowest level. So that's the time we have framed up uh, during the last six months. I, we, I, in my review, I have found that 80% of the cases are running on, on the line. So uh, there is um, the judges' commitments are there and where the ethics also comes up. So the way we are actually training our judges also at the lower court is saying that it is not part of a system only. It is not part of your processes, but it is also an ethics that actually binds you to close the cases on time and uh, comply with the uh, court management system, the uh, differentiated case management systems. Uh, so these are certainly a certain, uh, few things. Uh, I was just listening to uh, just Burns, uh, if I pronounced it properly, uh, uh, about the code of conduct, uh, how it works. And um, certainly I was very impressed with that. Uh, Stephen, I think, have you, I don't know, we have met before, I believe. So. Very nice to see you. Uh, others have not met a part of Purvi, uh, but I, I think these are certain things I would say that uh, a judge must not rely on what is written in the code of conduct. The, uh, it comes from you within and uh, it has to be, you must apply a judicial mind to deliver justices. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not, I'm not sure whether these are certain things that was were intended, but uh, sorry for not being very prepared, but just coming out of hand. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Niras and uh, Purvi. Thank you so much, sir, just for your candid observations and candid conversation. In fact, you know, when you talked about the pendency of cases, you know, I still remember, uh, you know, in July, when this issue was being asked in our parliament, you know, the law minister himself has, uh, you know, gave the figure that we have around 43 lakhs cases pending in 25 high courts. And about around 8 lakhs cases are a decade old. So, you know, the situation is quite similar. You know, we are neighboring countries and when it comes to the backlog and effective case management and court management practices, you know, we are still struggling. I mean, as per as an academicians on this side, we we feel that, and of course, uh, you know, Justice Abhilasha Kumari may have more insights into it, but, you know, we have been discussing about the backlog of cases, and, and you rightly pointed out, when it comes to ethics, it is more personal, and, and, you know, most of the times it comes from within. Thank you so much for your very candid talk. Thank you, sir. Thank you, very much. Thank you, sir. Uh, you rightly pointed out judicial ethics to be included as what to do and or and what not to do and also uh, uh, wherein you just uh, brought under the ambit timely justice within the ambit of judicial ethics so uh, over here we are just coming up with certain uh, definitely much needed uh, uh, lessons out of this particular panel discussions 
so we certainly take it uh, now i will just request judge andreas gelardo from brazil to give us the perspective of brazil uh, for the theme judicial ethics ma'am please please unmute yourself andrea judge andrea yes yes hello let let me know how many minutes i have because it seems to me uh, we are run of time just to make sure about it. you may take 15 20 20 minutes okay yeah let me check so now uh, good morning here in brazil i'm so glad to be part of this uh, international uh, months and uh, for me this topic is very important because it's entire my life né? it's come to my mindset when i become a judge with 24 four years old years old and nowadays i'm 47 and i have been a judge since 2000 and uh, when i decided to come to law school and uh, i always in my heart because i think to be a judge comes to your heart comes from your heart first uh, it seems to me law school uh, makes sense only, only for me to be a judge that's my goals but in in the outset i i never thought how to be a judge because being a judge is a practical thing right and you became aware the weight of this during the process but for now i'd like to say uh, uh, justice kumahi uh, purvi justice k case barnes and justice anu that uh, for me it's not surprise that we have the same standard of the ethics because it's come from Uh, Greek age, and uh, there is a similar standards um, uh, between us. But I want to share a little bit for because you have students here uh, an overview about Brazil because we are from civil law country, and uh, we have a one one uh, constitution for. entire 26 states and we have one civil code one civil law procedure code nationally for all states and judges and uh, the same thing uh, is regarding a uh, judicial code of the ethics and i prepare a powerpoint for students i'd like to share uh, And sorry, it's a little bit Brazilian judicial ethics, all right. And uh, I, I say in the first place, Brazil has a federal constitution, a civil code, and a civil procedure code prevailing in all states. There are 26 states in the federal district. District is civil code. and the civil law procedure and we have the standard of the superior court supreme court uh, supreme uh, supreme federal court superior uh, court of the justice and the uh, federal level and state level i i am a member of the state level and uh, na third level in that state and uh, uh e our uh, federal supreme court is equivalent to the us supreme court which assesses constitutional subjects and claims as well as appeals from state and federal justice regarding superior court of justice it's comparable to the french french courts of justice and it has exclusive jurisdiction to recognize and enforce 
for example, arbitration awards. And uh, state level uh, tribunals, uh, state constitutional established the jurisdiction of courts of first instance and courts of the appeal. And I'm a member of uh, the corporate and arbitration court in Sao Paulo, it's a third level, and, but it's not court of the appeal. And I decide issues about corporate bankruptcy and also uh, insolvency and arbitration. And how, how to become a judge in Brazil? I became a judge uh, with 24 years, it's not, similar in US or around the world. Oh, how can I, uh, in, at Penn State, say something, ask it to me, how could you become a judge with 24 years old? Well, uh, for being a judge in Brazil, you uh, first of all, you have to finish law school, five years. And also you have to, to to exercise law for at least three years, okay? And in Brazil, we take the hard exam to be a judge, five phases. Né? Uh, first, uh, multiple choice, uh, writing exam, psychological exam, oral exam, and uh, uh, interview about an investigation about your life. After this, you go to a school with, for, uh, with judges with high experience to go to the practice. And after you go to a small city normally to deal with multiple competence before specialization. I am a judge with specialization nowadays. But this is an overview about our system it's similar, for example, to uh, Germany system, French system, and with a different uh, kind of the requirements. Um, about judicial ethics, legal frame, uh, we have a judicial conduct rule, national organic law of the judiciary. This law nationally can regulate our conduct with the parties, with the lawyers, with ourselves in a public space and in a private space. Uh, you, you can ask me, we need a rule of this? We need a rule because we are from civil law. And this is a guide for us. Uh, Beside ethics is something inside you to be honest, to be compassionate, to be impartial, to be independent. We need a rule for this because we, if you can fail, you can respond for that. Civil, criminal, and uh, uh, administrative for that. We can lose our job because you know, being a judge is not only a job, it's a mission to distribute justice. It's a high weight in your back for entire life, not during uh, your job at the court, but inside your life, in a private life, how people will choose to, to be married. You can to be aware about this, uh, how your behavior uh, with others, because we are supposed to be an example of human being. And sometimes it's hard in a, in a sense because we can fail all, always because you can, in, in a day you are good, in an up way, in another day we are down. And so, but because we need this mission, we have a high standard behavior to uh, ourselves and to prove another's. And so uh, our judicial conduct uh, uh, regulate obligations of a judge. It's kind of compliance rule about uh, to be independence, independence, 
have serenity and accuracy to the provision and ex made ex officio, treat in a civilized manner the parties, the members of the prosecutor officer, attorneys, witnesses, the civil servants working for the judiciary. And also it's forbidden for, for judges to express opinions regarding a pending process. We cannot discuss process with uh, news or in a Instagram or, and it's, it's forbidden for us. The same obligation to give no opinion applies to judicial acts, opinion, sentence of judicial bodies. The prohibition includes also means of communication. Uh, also, the judge is obliged to compensate losses, damages, if they fail. It, it's a hard uh, rule, but it's necessary because this can guide us for our entire life during our job. And also, you have judicial ethics, national code of the ethics for judges. It's similar standards from India and US and Nepal because the high standard is for us that protect us is independence, impartiality, transparency, personal and professional integrity, diligence and dedication, courtesy, prudence, professional confidentiality. So, it's a high standard, but it's not difficult to, if you decide to be a good human being or you decide to do this job for the others. And this, for me, it's, uh, it's not the money that, in, that uh, uh, came first, but the job, the mission to, to give justice to say the law in a right way for the others. Sometimes because the, the law is, is, is not easy or is, uh, there is a vacuum, sometimes it's difficult to distribute the real justice, but we try, you should try, you have to try to do this. And uh, we have another rule inside our civil code procedure that this uh, regulates the way that you can uh, you can behave during the proceedings né? with we, with uh, equal treatment with the parties and uh, uh, give opportunity to, to to hear the case and also um, uh, fairness fairness uh, during the proceedings. And also do we have uh, in this civil law procedure code, we have the standards of disqualification about uh, our uh, position uh, in some cases. For example, we not to be, we are disqualified to decide that case if you are a friend uh, that one of the party or if or if you have if you have interest in that case or for example the rule uh, 144 said a judge is disqualified and therefore prevent from hearing a case in which he or she intervene as an agent of the party act act as an expert witness worked as a member of the public prosecutor officer or testify as a witness that he or she heard or another instance of jurisdiction having handled a decision about this case and, and so on. And uh, when the judge is spouse or civil partner or any other relative by blood or affinity is direct in line of the collateral to the third degree, inclusive is acting in this case as a public defender, lawyer, or member of the prosecutor. When the judge, his or his spouse or civil partner or any other relative by blood or affinity 
in direct line or collateral to the third degree, inclusive is a part to the proceeding. It's kind of the rule that instinctively you, you feel inside you, you cannot decide the case, but in our system, uh, the legislator decide this, regulate this for no matter, no matter what, no, no doubt about this situation. And uh, another rule that is very important is that if the, the judge has an action against one of the party, he not can be a judge. He can recuse uh, to be a judge in this case. We have another uh, rule about recusal in the civil uh, in our civil procedural code. And there is a recusal a judge who is a close friend or enemy or any of the parties of their lawyers who receive gifts from people who have interest in the action either before or after of the proceedings who advise any of the parties regard to subject matter of the action or provides the means to cover the expenses of the lawsuit. And when any of the parties a creditor or debitor of the judge, the judge, spouse, or civil partner, their respective relative, in direct line of descent to the third degree inclusive, uh, who has interest in the adjudication of the action in favor of any parties. A judge may recuse him or herself for reason of the conscience without having to state said. And sometimes it's happened, but it's not usually. And you can say to the tribunal the, 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 the motive, you cannot say in a process, but you can disclose this uh, to the tribunal or the organization, judiciary organization can control that issue about recusal. And the allegation of disqualification shall, shall be inadmissible when uh, it was provoked by the one of the who allegs it and the party who makes the allegation has performed an act that implies the express acceptance to the accused. And uh, you can see that the, uh, our system can uh, regulate everything for judges in a, in a civil law country. And uh, e nowadays we have a judicial conduct in a social media rules because everybody uh, nowadays has Instagram, Facebook, and you, you have to take into account that some situations you cannot share on Facebook or Instagram. And uh, it's regarding your privacy and regard, uh, regarding your opinion, political opinion, for example, and uh, the way that you express yourself, for example, uh, you cannot put a um, photo with swimsuits or something, but that's okay if you are uh, if you are if you are a good exportist or athlete, you can share some pictures. Uh, there is not there is not a problem in Brazil because sometimes in Brazil we have an open mind about some grounds of the, the behavior, but the guide exists. And our court disciplined uh, uh, adopts selective and criteria based and take part in a social networks. Moderation, decency, respectful, uh, uh, avoid express opinions or share information that about process or may harm the concept of the social, social uh, society and uh, also attitude when taking part in social networks and um, also about to express opinion uh, that which may harm the concept 
the concept of society in relation to the independence, impartiality, integrity, and competence of judge, or which may change the level of the confidence of the public into the judiciary power. And it's uh, forbidden to make statements on pending proceedings. It's forbidden to publish opinions of political parties. It's forbidden to publish or share opinion with, with, which are characterized to promote discrimination or hate or violence. And uh, let me open here. So uh, I put something uh, to compare, to make some comparison between American Bar Association and federal statute ap applicable to the federal judge. When I study at Penn State Law, we have the, the, the uh, one semester about professional responsibility uh, for lawyers and judges. And I remember that it's similar standard about uh, judicial ethics, uh, especially about impartiality, comp uh, impartiality, competence, and diligence, and also um, some prohibitions about uh, uh, not speak about a process or uh, uh, or public opinions about proceedings. And I saw it very interesting. I put to share for students. I can share this, this entire PowerPoint. Sorry if I go fast because I'm afraid to, to, to run off time. And, but uh, what I, I want to, to say, uh, for all students that if you decide became a judge, let me open here. Let me open this. I stop share this. Okay. If you decide being a judge, you have taken into account that your private life, it will be narrow, disciplined or regulated by the rules the rules of the ethics and the rules of the or tribunal, whatever. But if you decide get this mission, not a job, it's it seems to me this brings to me a a, 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 a happiness all day. This all day because to share justice, it's a kind uh, it's a kind of thing that can uh, approximate, how can I say in English, but can uh, stay narrow of the divine. And this, it's, it's a kind that uh, I like so much. I, I live for that. And you have to be an example for, of the human being. If you are in your house or in a public space or during the proceedings, that uh, it's my my advice for Indian students and sorry if my I fail something in my English. I when I speak fast something uh, goes wrong, wrong but uh, I hope you can understand that and thank you again for this opportunity and obrigada e namaste. Thank you ma'am. Uh, we are seeing over here the uh, expansion of the counters of the judicial ethics. Um, and now we had the views from different jurisdiction. We have the uh, views from Brazilian uh, jurisdiction. We have the views from US, from Nepal, from India. Uh, now uh, I have one question uh, uh, received. Uh, and the question is to Judge Barnes. Uh, sir, uh, the uh, the participant is asking that as a judge, you might have faced uh, or you you generally uh, face many dilemmas while giving the judgments. 
how you resolve these dilemmas? Uh, thank you, and thank you for the yes. thank you for the question. Uh, I practiced law for twenty years, so I was a practitioner for twenty years, and uh, it was a different experience than being a judge. And I appreciate the question because, you know, like all of us in our respective jobs, I would suggest that most of the time we make decisions and their decisions because they're the same kind of decisions that we, that, that we make. Uh, and then we have decisions we have to make that are quite, sometimes quite overwhelming. And uh, as a judge, I recognize that I'm not always going to get it right, but I will do my very best. And I, uh, as my fellow colleagues uh, on this panel, uh, it's a process of taking in as much information as we can and then applying those facts to the law and then uh, you know, trying to be sensitive to whatever the situation uh, is. So in a roundabout way, uh, some decisions are difficult as all of us have those, uh, but if, but oftentimes, sometimes the decision is very difficult, but the law, applying the facts of the law, the law seems to speak very clearly on, the, on what decision needs to be made. Thank you for the question. Thank you, sir. Uh, now, uh, due to the paucity of time, I, I'm just taking the last question of the day. Uh, and the question is to uh, Justice Abhilasha Kumari. Uh, Ma'am, the participant is asking that there is a traditional view that a judge should say very little outside the courtroom and exercise considerable free speech within the courtroom. Your views on this common wisdom. Ma'am. I think that a judge should not exercise free speech inside the courtroom. A judge should hear more than he or she speaks, should imbibe and try to understand the points put forth by both sides and not speak so much unless it is necessary. But outside the courtroom, of course, a judge should not speak about the cause that is before him or her or express any political views or other views, because that will, you know, be taken amiss. And it is not part of the duties of a judge, because a judge may be having, as I said earlier, a judge may be coming from a particular background of society, having a particular philosophy, or certain propensity. But when you sit in the chair of justice, all that is forgotten. What is to be remembered is the case before you, and you are there to dispense justice in accordance with law. Justice in accordance with law. And for that, you have to listen to both sides in a very deep manner so, so, so that you catch the particular nuances and then apply the law to them. And till the last moment, a judge must be open-minded and should the main consideration should be that I should be able to do complete justice according to my conscience and my understanding and knowledge of the law. So therefore, if a judge speaks too much in the court, in my view, it would hamper this court. The lesser a judge speaks, of course, it's not that a judge should sit like a stone statue. You have to interact at certain points, have to ask questions, but those questions should be to elucidate the matter to for the better understanding of a judge, not to, you see, throw somebody off balance or, you know, just for, ask for the sake of asking. It should be something that will enhance the, the judge's view and perspective of what the parties are trying to say. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. I mean, uh, you know, uh, Justice Abhilasha Kumari, Judge Keith Vans, and Judge Henry, I just would like to share. In fact, we are missing Judge Mel over here. We have uh, Judge Mel Flangenden as our agent professor. And thanks to Stephen Barnes for introducing to us Judge Mel. And she had made a very uh, powerful presentation. On 10th of February, we had a seminar on implicit biases. 
you know and you know especially you know uh, she is an expert in discussing on implicit biases and how this inherent implicit biases you know that affects ultimately the decision making process and it was a very in, uh, powerful uh, presentation which she had made and we really miss her in this uh, in in this uh, talk today uh, thank you you made a very important point because judges are the product of the society itself and it's very difficult to you know to be free away from that uh, you know that philosophy of our own individual philosophy that always being reflected in the judgments that we deliver so thank you so much for this important point thank you all uh, so now i will request uh, our student adesh shinde uh, to deliver vote of thanks adesh gratitude is the fairest blossom that springs from the soul greetings to everyone present over here in this virtual session it is a matter of immense pride and pleasure for me to propose the vote of thanks on this momentous occasion it was an absolute honor and privilege for all of us to host honorable justice anil kumar sinha honorable judge keith barnes honorable justice abhilasha kumari honorable judge andrea dilhard obama and i adesh shinde on behalf of institute of law nirma university wholeheartedly extend my sincere thanks to our esteemed panel for accepting our invitation and making this an insightful and thought provoking session on judicial ethics and i firmly believe that this session has left a great impact on all of us i extend a heartfelt gratitude to our respected professor dr purvi pokharyal ma'am director and dean institute of law nirma university for organizing the international teaching month which has served as a great platform for knowledge sharing by distinct persons from different walks of life and i would also like to acknowledge the presence and participation of professor dr stephen barnes thank you so much sir for your constant guidance and support further i would also like to extend my thanks to assistant professor neeraj sharma sir for moderating the session and ensuring a streamlined conduction of the session today next i would like to thank the international teaching month 2021 team professor shreya shrivastava ma'am head international office ilnu mr gagandeep khanduja sir assistant registrar ilnu mr ramesh nambishan sir office superintendent ilnu digant rathod sir and all members of our administrative section for being the constant support behind this whole event lastly a big thanks to all our students and faculty members of institute of law for their constant participation and cooperation and making this event a successful one it was an absolute pleasure to host all of you thank you once again thank you thank you thank all. you thank you all thank you so much for joining have a great time thank you thank you